When mighty roast beef was the Englishman's food, it ennobled our veins and enriched our blood. Our soldiers were brave and our courtiers were good. Oh, the roast beef of old England and old English roast beef. But now we are dwindled to what shall I name? A sneaking poor race, half begotten and tame who sullies those honours that once shone in fame. Oh, the roast beef of old England and old English roast beef. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Jolly Heretic. Now, what I want to talk about today is not exactly the issue of roast beef. Um, it's a related issue. It's the issue of veganism. Why and vegetarianism? Why, oh, why? Oh, why are so many people these days vegans? You are even seeing vegan menus in McDonald's. What is going on? Who are these people? Who are the kind of people who become vegans? Why has it become so popular? Why has it become so popular so quickly? And what is ultimately underlying it? Where does the vegan come from? Well, fortunately, some years ago, a scientist by the name of Rosenfeld did a detailed meta-analysis of all of the studies that had looked at the psychology of people who are vegans and vegetarians. And what he found was this. People who um, <clears throat> are vegetarian are... Uh, or vegan, are three times higher in suffering from depression than are omnivores. And people who are, uh, uh, who, are who are vegetarian are a third more likely to suffer from very severe depression than are omnivores. So that's the first clear finding. People who are vegetarian are prone to suffering from depression. And in general, depression correlates with the personality trait neuroticism, which is at least 50% heritable, if not more, at about 0.8. So what it's telling us is that people who are vegetarian are likely to be more mentally unstable than are people who are omnivores. But there's more research. Um, a study by Feiler and Egloff found that people who are vegetarian are higher in openness and lower in conscientiousness than are those who are omnivores. So let's be clear, openness is the personality trait which relates to basically hypnotizability. If you are high in openness, you are more open to new things, you are more open to fads, you are more open to being basically indoctrinated, you are more open... Um, to anything novel than are those who are low in openness. Conscientiousness um, refers to rule following, and so following traditions, this sort of thing, would be associated with, and indeed religiousness is, is, is as well, associated with conscientiousness. So we're seeing that these vegetarians are mentally unstable, open to indoctrination, um, and also simply kind of impulsive. Another study by Forstel and Nozek found again high in openness and high in neuroticism. So that's the essence. I mean, there are other conscientiousness is perhaps a smaller issue, but what we're dealing with for sure is people who are high in mental instability and high in openness. Openness, as I've said, easy to indoctrinate, left uh, liberal kind of values, left wing, open to fads, very much a kind of a, a, a follower of anything new and anything novel. And so you can see exactly why veganism would have been attractive. In the 90s, it, the same psychology that would have been attracted to vegetarianism is now attracted to veganism because vegetarianism is no longer novel, it's no longer interesting, it's no longer new, it's no longer avant-garde, it no longer gives them a sense of being new and thus superior to other people and so therefore vegetarianism can be cast aside in favour of veganism, in favour of the even more extreme option. Secondly, neuroticism. Now, neuroticism really shouldn't be much of a surprise. There are studies, uh, in, uh, per, uh, the Hills et al. is the study, found that extrinsic religiousness, that is to say, 
openly, outwardly conforming um, to religiousness is um, very much associated with neuroticism. People who are open, people who are ex ex open, not in intrinsically, what they actually believe doesn't matter. But those who want to be seen to be religious, uh, those people tend to be higher in neuroticism. Um, secondly, uh, just a moment, I'm sorry. Okay, um, so those people are tend to be higher in neuroticism. Um, and therefore we can see that a strong element of this is likely to be virtue signalling, is likely to be asserting by being vegan that they are superior to others, that they are more moral. It can be seen in terms of a, a whole puritanical discourse that can really be in some ways traced back to Christianity in a lot of ways, or even further, to monotheism, whereby you assert the, the reversal of values, as Nietzsche would put it, whereby you assert your social status via a reversal of normal values and via denial. So you say, yes, I may not have wealth, I may not have power, but I am more moral. And this is the way that I am displaying that I am more moral. And by looking more moral and seeming more moral, of course, it makes it more likely that I might be able to attain some kind of power and some kind of influence. And so that's the nature of virtue signalling. A second issue that was found in this paper by Hills was that those who frequently change religious identity those who have undergone a conversion experience, those who were once not religious and now are religious, those people tend to be very high in neuroticism. Why? Because if people are mentally unstable, then they basically don't, they, they don't feel happy in who they are, they don't feel happy in their own skin, they're, all, they're desperately looking all the time for something to make sense of the world, they go through periods of profound despair as well, and when they go through those periods of profound despair, then they are attracted to some kind of religion, some kind of ideology, which would seem to make sense of the world. And so consequently, it follows that these that, that, uh, that this is true of religiousness, people go through phases of religious fervour, a high neuroticism, and it makes sense that people that will go through phases of, for example, being a being a, a, a vegan or being a vegetarian, you would it, make, it makes sense that they would be high in neuroticism. They have a weak sense of self. Neuroticism is defined by very strong negative feelings, questioning yourself, not being secure in who you are. And so you can see how that would involve a weak sense of self and constantly searching for something to give you a, a, a firm sense of identity and for this frightening black, dark world to make sense. Now, um, it's interesting then that veganism and vegetarianism are quite strongly associated with senses of identity. Now, I, I would change in identity. Now, it's quite clear that they give you a sense of identity because they force you in a largely omnivorous society to, to stand out from the, the, the broader crowd. You will be compelled to assert that you are a vegetarian. You will be known, um, <coughs> not least because of the social difficulties you cause, as a person who is vegetarian. Uh, I was once at a party when I was an undergraduate, and we, we put on, the, the people whose party was, put on this lovely party, and this particular girl, Sophie her name was, dressed in black all the time, um, comes around and suddenly says, oh no, um, I, I, I told you I was a vegetarian. And so therefore a, a different meal has to be independently prepared just to satisfy her vegetarianism, which is so self-righteous and so rigid and so antisocial that she can't be even put it aside just for one evening. Uh, it, it's more important to her, this, this, this virtue signalling identity and this sense of structure, than it is getting on with people. It's selfish sense of identity. So it's not like she was allergic to meat. Um, and so, anyway, what was found was that 70% of vegans and 86% of vegetarians go back to being omnivorous eventually. They, as it were, backslide. So although about 0.5% of people in the USA, according to statistics from some years ago now, and two are, are vegan and, and 2%, probably more now, and 2% are vegetarian, they backslide at this massive rate. So most people who... Um, have ever been vegetarian have gone back to eating meat eventually. 
which shows you again that it is a matter of an unstable identity and a desire for certainty and clarity and a sense of self and all this and virtue signaling and the ga uh, uh, attempt to gain status, um, particularly at a young age. And there is a sense in which neuroticism is higher among young people, particularly people in their 20s and particularly girls in their 20s, according to the data. And neuroticism goes down uh, as you get older. Um, and also this need to gain status and whatever is quite a big thing, of course, among young people. That's when they've got to step out into the world. So it makes sense that it would happen um, in this context. Another interesting correlate of vegetarianism and of veganism, which again makes sense in terms of understanding it as a product of neuroticism and mental instability, is anorexia. There's one study found that 52% uh, of anorexics anorexic girls are vegetarian or vegan compared to 12% of controls, uh, female controls. So, of course, uh, anorexia is associated with extremely high levels of neuroticism, extremely high levels of depression, an unstable sense of self. Um, and so it's, it's, it can be seen, firstly, as a way perhaps of helping you to lose weight. So it's comorbid with, with simply a, with, with, with a desire to lose weight, which is an unrealistic desire because these people who are anorexic don't need to lose weight. They have mind-body um, dysphoria. They have a, they, they, their, their sense of self is skewed and unrealistic because being high in neuroticism, um, they're, they're so anxious about themselves and the nature of who they are that they... They, they compensate for this by developing an unrealistic and inaccurate sense of self. Um, and often they also develop sort of fetishes and things like this as well, and fetishise a certain kind of appearance. Um, but so it shows you the kind of, the, the fact that, the, that, the, that veganism and vegetarianism is comorbid with, or at that rate, with uh, mind-body dysphoria, um, so it, it demonstrates to you the degree to which it is related to mental instability. Now, what is the reason for this? What is the reason for the relationship with mental instability? Well, there are two possibilities here. The most likely possibility, I suspect, is that they are neurotic, they are high in mental instability, and therefore they become vegetarian or vegan. And that is consistent with the high level of people reverting back, which implies it's a matter of um, unstable identity. It's consistent with the heritability of neuroticism being very high of at least 50%, if not if not more. Um, it's consistent with it being comorbid with other signs of uh, mental instability, uh, such, such, as, such, as, um, such as anorexia uh, and, uh, and, and eating disorders and that kind of thing. Um, and so um, I would say it's very likely that it's that way round. Also, it's consistent with the fact that it's largely a female thing. Women are more likely vegetarians than men, although part of that might be empathy towards animals and this being higher... Uh, among women, uh, but it seems to be very likely that it's partly a genetic issue. But it could also, of course, be a, a product of becoming a vegetarian, although this seems unlikely because these people that, that, that uh, go vegetarian, they often flip back and forth and so on. So it's not as if it's not as if being vegetarian, uh, becoming meat eaters then cures their neuroticism. It doesn't. But Anyway, um, you know, let's have a look at this. It could be caused by their diet. If people are vegetarian and particularly vegan, they will be or vegan. They will be deficient in B12, in calcium, in omega-3, in fatty acids, in iron, and in vitamin D. Now, if they try to replace milk as the source of calcium with soy, this can cause hormone disruption, and it means that they are not getting enough nutrients. Um, similarly, uh, a lack of iron can lead to physical illness, lethargy, low energy, that sort of thing. A lack of omega-3 can lead to depression, anxiety, and other uh, mental problems of that kind. A lack of B12 uh, can lead to depression, delusion, incoherence, and simply stupidity, uh, because it means that the brain is not functioning properly. Now, in so much as these people do not report the, um, th all of these symptoms, they simply seem to, it simply seems to be associated with neuroticism. Uh, it seems to be more likely that this is a significantly genetic issue, although vegetarianism and veganism is likely to make it worse. Uh, another problem, of, a health problem, by the way, with vegetarianism is they will often compensate for it by having far too much carbs and this makes them fat. I know a woman who, it's ironic really, she's a vegan and she's chubby. 
I assume the reason is because she consumes far too much in the way of carbohydrates. But anyway, there are clearly severe problems with being vegetarian and with being vegan. And, peop and certainly with being vegan. And um, there's a good argument for saying it's extremely bad for your health. You'd have to be utterly abusive to put your child or your, or, or on a vegan diet or maintain a vegan diet while you were pregnant because such a diet would damage the child. And there was a study uh, that looked at this. Nathan Coffness has presented quite an interesting study on this where he's brought together all the evidence. And he has shown it's quite clear it would damage, it would cause the child potentially irreversible brain damage due to the lack of important nutrients and vitamins um, at, at important developmental stages for it to be on such a diet. So it is basically abusing your children to put them on a vegetarian and particularly on a vegan diet because there is simply no sufficient supplement for what that child can get from eggs and milk uh, and meat. Um, uh, now, the, and, um, interestingly, in fact, there was a study that was conducted in Kenya some years ago, and this is also explored in Coffins' article, which showed that children who were on omnivorous diets um, ended up with higher IQ scores, controlling for other factors, than did children who were on vegetarian diets. And this makes a great deal of sense, because, of course, we are evolved to be a vegetarian. Our evolutionary, to be, sorry, to be omnivorous. We are evolved to eat meat. We are evolved to not be vegetarian. We, have, we are evolved to eat meat. Um, so why would this not be the case? We know perfectly well that you could get far more nutrition uh, out of meat uh, with the same amount of effort than you can out of vegetables. You have to engage in far more chewing to get the same amount of nutrition uh, um, um, out of meat than you do out of vegetables. Consequently, our ancestors, by turning to meat, attained more nutrition more efficiently. Because they did this, they were able to save vast amounts of energy that would otherwise be spent chewing and finding vegetables and things. And this helped them to grow a large brain. And eating meat and having lots of meat permits you, you need, it's, the brain is extremely energy, um, uh, an extremely uh, uh, voracious uh, user of the body's bioenergetic resources and you need as much nutrition as possible and it needs to be as efficiently delivered as possible and the only way we can do that is through the consumption of meat. And so consequently we grew larger and larger brains, our jaws became smaller because we didn't need to chew so much and because also then we, we developed cooking and so we didn't have to bite things off the bone and we grew a larger and larger and larger brain. I suspect it is no coincidence that the people who have the largest brains in the world are the Inuit and the Inuit have an almost exclusively meat-based diet because there is simply no other food available in the, or historically there wasn't, in the environment in which they live. Bigger brain means more, needs more nutrients, and if you don't give these to a baby or to a young child, you will harm its growth, because we are evolved to eat meat. We are, some people say humans are homo religiousness, religiousness, homo religiousness. We are also homo carnivorous. Now you can be count, it can be countered that there are various groups in various parts of the world, Brahmin groups and so on, that don't eat any meat. There are vegetarians or even vegans and they do perfectly well. But the problem with this argument is that they live in an environment in which there's f abundant food all around, lots and lots of vitamin D from the sun. We we people in Europe, in Northern Europe, we are not evolved to this ecology. It is not healthy for us. We need our vitamin D. We need to eat meat. And it is more uh, historically hunter gathering is something that we are more closely descended from, something that our ancestors did more recently uh, than did theirs. We are more evolved to require meat. And you can expect the consequences to be worse um, if we drop meat from the diet, um, as can be seen on the evidence of what happens to children. If you, if you give them a vegan diet, they can literally die through lack of the appropriate nutrients. So, people should not 
be vegan. It is not healthy to be vegan, and it is not and and it is not particularly healthy even um, in certain ecologies to be vegetarian. So what has happened? Well, the fact, the very fact that the propensity towards vegetarianism and veganism correlates with mental instability should, of course, tell you what has happened. You've watched enough of my videos by now to know what I see as the underlying switch of these kinds of things, and that is simply the rise of the spiteful mutant. We are evolved, we have been evolved over a long period of time to need to eat meat and to want to eat meat and to be evolved to eat meat. As Darwinian conditions relax in the wake of the Industrial Revolution, then of course you are going to get people who are just by genetic chance and also simply because of the correlation, as, as the child mortality rate collapses from 40% to 1%, all of those children who would have died, who would never have passed on their genes, some of them passing on their genes, and they're going to be the children with the bad immune systems who would have died under conditions where there was no medicine, but Spite, spite of mutations of the body correlate with spite of mutations of the mind because 88% of the genome is the mind, as we've discussed before. People that have physical mutations will have mental mutations. And so consequently, you get these mutants who advocate maladaptive things which would have been unhealthy under Darwinian conditions. And one of those things would have been vegetarianism and veganism. They then reach positions of power positions of authority, uh, not least because the, the, uh, the, uh, the heritability of socioeconomic status across numerous generations in England has been 70%, uh, meaning that they are, they are the descendants of the people who were in positions of authority at the time of the Industrial Revolution, and those people, um, the Darwinian conditions were less severe on them, so they went into higher mutational load earlier. So they end up in these positions of power, telling people that they should be vegetarian, telling people that they should be vegan, and then those who, that so, by a social epistasis, those who even do not carry the mutant genes, but are high in openness, let's say, or moderately high in mental instability, are induced uh, into doing this maladaptive thing, and it spreads throughout the society. That's the first thing that's going on. The second thing that's going on it's just something that's ancient and can be traced back throughout the history of Europe. And this is the constant need to um, attain status, if particularly if you are of middling status in the society, to attain status via virtue signalling. If you're at the top, you don't really need to virtue signal that badly. You've got pretty much everything you want, so you can kind of do what you want, really. You're, you're, you're immune from these things. If you're at the bottom, then you're going to be low, relatively low in IQ, so you won't really understand the benefits of virtue signaling. You're going to be, because you will have been under Darwinian conditions for the most time, perhaps there'll be the fewest mutants among you anyway, so you'll be the most kind of natural and normal um, in, your, in your instincts in these various ways. Um, but um, but uh, you'll, be, you'll be the least inclined to look for status and all this kind of thing. But if you're in the if you're in the middle, if you're in the middle, how could you how could you attain status without money? You do it through virtue, through stressing your virtue. In times of past, in the Victorian times, you'd st you'd stress your sexual constancy, your religious morals, the church ladies, and so on. And of course, these people, these multiculturalists, are the new church ladies and veganism and vegetarianism, particularly when they are evangelical and they involve people turning up and campaigning against barbecues and whatever else, are simply examples of the new church ladies, the new moral system. Um, and it is a moral system, of course, which wouldn't have helped them under conditions of Darwinian selection because it is not associated with belief in God and collective worship of moral God, which is what we were evolved to do. It is a moral system that is negatively associated with having children. Those that have children tend to be those who are believing in God and collectively worshipping a moral God. It is the cry of the mutant. That is what vegetarianism and particularly veganism are. They are just the new cry of the mutant and wonder, and they will try and push us like they did with smoke, uh, with smoking or whatever else into cutting down our meat consumption, look for ways to have less meat in the diet, and it becomes part of this broader multicultural discourse which says you should put the, 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 the interests of other uh, um, um, <clears throat> extended genotypes before your own. Oh, there's not, enough, there's not enough meat in the world, we have to cut down our meat consumption so others can have it. No. 
No, we need to follow. Um, we need to follow. If we want to survive, we need to follow what we what we have done under conditions of Darwinian selection. We need to eat meat. We need to eat more meat. We need to find out ways of getting more meat in our diet. We need to once again become, as the French call us, the roast beef. The people who eat lots and lots of roast beef. The army that marches on its stomach. The army that marches on beef. We need to be, as they say in the song by Henry Fielding, of the roast beef of old England. They say, when good Queen Elizabeth sat on the throne, ere coffee and tea and such slip slops were known, the world was in terror when ere she did frown. Oh, the roast beef of old England and old English roast beef. Oh, then we had stomachs to win and to fight when wrongs were a-cooking to do ourselves right. But now we're just a, I could, but good night. No. We won't go gentle to that good night. And one of the ways we can avoid doing so is by eating beef. Beef. The roast beef of old England. Well, I hope this has been of interest. And um, if it has, then feel free to drop me a few pennies or guineas on subscribe star so I can buy some more roast beef. I actually went to Lidl today in an attempt to get some roast beef, but there was none there. And also on Patreon and PayPal. And uh, if you have any ideas, then do get in touch. This was an idea that one of you suggested. And so I'm always happy to uh, to listen to ideas and to come up with uh, you know, new ideas for videos. And um, if you do one thing this week before I do my next video, please, please, please go and have some roast beef cooked rare. And, um, goodbye!